Okay, so we start. Um, so thanks for joining everyone for for the lecture today, which will be um, an online conversation, a performative lecture uh, between Rupert's resident Lithuanian artist Maria Namchenko and Professor Barbara Helm from University of Groningen. I will quickly just introduce the whole idea of this event and introduce the speakers before Maria and Barbara joins me. So uh, basically the event is the outcome of Maria's two month residency at Rupert where she was developing a video project titled LAK or LAC, a long-term artistic research about storks, their cultural, political and environmental context across the globe. After the residency, Maria will continue her project and uh, film in Lithuania and later hopefully follow the Stark routes to Palestine where the project had originated last year. Uh, today's conversation between Maria and Professor Barbara Helm will focus on the concept of migration, both bird and human, as well as what difficulties Starks face today as their original mig migratory routes, habitats and relationship to humans uh, are being challenged by growing industry, aviation, uh, new types of farming and other capitalist activities. We will also address the risks that uh, birds face when our human knowledge and understanding about storks becomes further and further removed from their uh, real existence and becomes too much fictionalized. The conversation will be hand held in English and will last around, well, between 45-60 minutes. It will be recorded, so you will have an opportunity to come back to it. It will be shared on uh, Rupert's Facebook uh, page. If you have any questions, you can post them uh, uh, during the conversation in the chat section below the translation. And uh, if we have enough time after the conversation, we will get back to them. Um, I will shortly introduce both of the speakers today. So. Barbara Helm joining us today is professor for biological rhythms of natural organisms at Groningen Institute for Evolutionary uh, Life Sciences, University of Groningen. She's also a visiting professor of, at Institute of Biodiversity, Animal Health and Comparative Medicine uh, at University of Glasgow in the UK. And um, her relation to birds comes from the childhood um, from her childhood Barbara has been fascinated by birds and in particular their migrations during her studies in Germany and then USA she picked up similar fascination with biological rhythms an example the ways organisms from unicells to humans have embodied flocks her current research focuses on migration and timekeeping with heavy focus on birds which Barbara studies in the wild and captivity Maria Nemchenko, our current resident at Rupert, is a Lithuanian artist, writer, and creative learning facilitator working between Kaunas, Lithuania, and Glasgow uh, in Sc Scotland. Uh, Maria received her MFA from Glasgow School of Arts in 2016. Before that, she studied at uh, Camberwell College of Arts and finished in 2013. Uh, she also, last year, presented her solo exhibition at um, Glasgow-based uh, gallery Civic Room. She also self-published a book, which you can find if you follow the link posted in our website uh, in the uh, event announcement post. And she was also resident at Eflux residency at Al Qatan Foundation in Ramallah, Palestine last year. And I think this is how the project started, uh, which will be um, reflected today. And um, as I mentioned, Maria is um, our resident. She has been our resident for two months, and actually it's her final day today. And uh, Maria was selected for Rupert residency during the additional open call, which was uh, uh, made available uh, this spring in April 2020. Uh, the open call was focused on um, in, uh, locally based artists and researchers who are currently in Vilnius. Um, so, I now would like to invite Marianne Barbara to join, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. And if you have any questions, you can yeah. don't hesitate and please join. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Katrina, if you could um, let me share the screen, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, so, 
Hello, everyone, and thanks, Katrina, for introducing us, uh, us yeah, together with Barbara, and overall for Rupert actually for giving an opportunity to um, to show this fracture of um, fracture of a bigger project luck. Um, and thank you, Barbara, as well, for agreeing to have a conversation and this kind of performative uh, lecture performance with me today. And I heard of, I heard Barbara speaking on BBC Radio 4 uh, podcast in our times about bird migration, where um, a host of the program together with Barbara and a few other guests uh, discussed migration, where birds go, why they go, uh, the biological clocks. Um, and so on. So I really was fascinated with how Barbara was speaking with, uh, very, with a lot of passion and she was being very enthusiastic, um, communicating her knowledge about birds and the phenomenon of migration. Um, so the dialogue between us will travel between the themes of metaphorical and real flights, as well as birds, um, both as a symbol and as a living creature as well. Um, the video which we'll be seeing throughout this conversation, um, it's a documentation of an ultimate symbol of the symbols, um, a tattoo being made. Um, so I guess that's kind of a reflect of, on the idea of what is a symbol and what is a symbol of a bird. Um, so I hope it won't happen to you like it happened to me um, yesterday where I got hypnotized by the video and forgot to respond to anything else. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, maybe if I, are you okay to start Barbara? Yes, of course. Hello. Um, so maybe I will start from asking a quite broad question. And if you could um, define what do you think, what, what defines migration in your opinion? Yeah, there are lots of different ways of defining migration in the animal kingdom or in biology. And I personally take a, a bit of a pragmatic view. I think of migration as movements that are um, back and forth. So moving somewhere and returning, kind of aligning with nature's rhythms. For example, storks coming back in spring and leaving in autumn from the breeding grounds and so on where movements just in one direction for example if a um, seed of a, of a plant flies and falls onto a ground are often called dispersal but there are other biologists who don't make this distinction and they would think of any movement really of an organism as being um, migration so movement from one place to another and settling there mm -hmm. and, and and i guess and returning as well so it's like a cyclical mm -hmm. um well, yeah, the way I narrow it down, just to kind of keep it contained, it would be cyclical. But um, there are some biologists who don't require this to be cyclical as well. Mm -hmm. But for me, this is kind of kind of narrow sense migration. Mm -hmm. So how do you think um, migration between people and birds could be def dif differentiated? And do you think there are any parallels between them? Um, yes, definitely. So I think um, it's very strong parallels because migrations in, in wild organisms have always been caused by some drivers, you know, something that happened in the environment, either it happens just now when this animal, for example, decides to, to leave, or it's happening over evolutionary times, so that every time, you know, every year there's a severe winter and uh, an animal needs to get away from it or so. But in any event, there are reasons for these migrations. And these reasons, I believe, are shared between all these organisms, including us humans. Uh, I think this was more evident historically when quite a few of the human cultures actually also had movements. Like, for example, I come from uh, southern Germany, like near the Alps. And there, there's a big thing every, every spring, still celebrated. How oh, people are driving the cows up on the on the high meadows, and they actually stay with them um, for the entire summer. And then when winter comes, they're going back to the villages. Also, they're making it a big event with flowers and so on. 
And then there are many cultures of humans who actually have been moving with the animals over large distances. For example, in uh, like um, Arctic regions, like Sami and other people who move with the with the, with the reindeer um, across like very very large scales. So I think humans have this kind of back and forth migration as well. Um, but nowadays, I think probably some of the migration, much of the migration of humans does not have to be back and forth. Sometimes it is. For example, migrant workers as well come and go for seasons to work in a country. But often it's also when we talk about human migration that humans just go um, to one place, maybe they emigrate, leave home, and then they reach a new place. But again, often they're, they're moving away from overcrowding, you know, no, no, no jobs, no food, or like the climate is getting worse. It's not very good to live in a place anymore and so on. So yes. I think there's a lot of it is, 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 is still in, in, still shared. Yeah, I guess what I've been thinking, it's kind of, um, I guess seeing, seeing birds, because birds also move for a specific reason of survival um, and the reasons people move also is due to kind of even the economical reasons but those economical reasons are in order to survive or have a better life etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and what is actually um, um, interesting and quite quite out there is like how my this is quite similar migrations in the sense they're being, especially in, in the kind of media, in the tabloid media, they're being um, defined in completely different terms. So let's say um, human migration is, you know, it's not, especially during the migrant crisis, the, the terms that were being used to describe people and kind of to um, just be completely against it, um, whereas the same, the same tabloid, tabloid newspapers, tabloid media would be defining bird migration in a completely different terms, sort of like, you know, this is a, um, this great, fantastical phenomenon of nature, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so why do you think people are so fascinated with um, migration of birds overall? Well, I think they have been for, for forever, really, as long as we, we know. I mean, one of the things is, Bird migration, in particular, is really super striking. If you are in a in, in a place with lots of birds, and you just see these flocks, sometimes of thousands of animals, you can't overlook it. But it's also uh, that that people, I think, in, in yeah, for for millennia, um, have really watched nature very very closely for any um, signs of the coming and going of the year and of the seasons. And uh, I don't know, it was super impressive that various cultures, Mayans or like Stonehenge, or so people knew exactly, basically from from watching nature, um, how the year came and go. And migratory birds were so obvious. So there are cultures, for example, in Borneo and so on, were actually the return of a migratory species um, tells the farmers when to plant their crops. So there's really like a migration calendar in some 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 cultures. So I think that's that's one thing that they associate it with a with a with a with a year and with a well in northern countries with the return of spring and so on. It's a good sign when the birds come back. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think the same in um, old kind of Arabic calendars or actually in many agricultural sort of societies because. Um, people needed to kind of know maybe when to sow crops and stuff and mm -hmm. yeah. really the animals were a good um, indicator of um, for these for these things yeah there's lots of like like folklore uh, around it um, and in some cultures then people actually even dress up as a bird that comes back and brings spring or so so, so I think there's a lot of, of, of closeness for that that reason mm -hmm. and then yeah. of course it's it's also uh, you know, it indicates so much freedom to to us humans. Mm -hmm. And um, so, what do you think there were like? Because um, you were saying obviously there was like folkloric or kind of more um, observational um, 
predictions of what was happening um, with birds and sort of them migrating or disappearing and reappearing. Um, can you name a few maybe um, scientific theorists, um, sort of the first theorists of where birds were disappearing? Yeah, I guess some of this today we would probably not call um, uh, a theory anymore. Well, theory, yes, but maybe not science. <laughs> people came up with lots and lots of, of, of crazy ideas. It was always a difference between some people watching very closely, seeing them come and go, and some people just trying to explain where they went. If you didn't know how large the world was and so on, you know, beyond your 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 your, your place of living, it was kind of a miracle, and so I'll um, just tell you <laughs> about a, a few interesting theories. One was um, that the, the birds actually transmuted, they changed from one to the other, so that a species that would only be there in the summer would change. I mean, it's not so absurd in a way, because change, birds, of course, you know, molt and they change their feathers. So they were thinking, oh, for example, the red start would change into a robin because the robin stays in winter, you know? And so that was one explanation that people had, but others were more bizarre. For example, birds like swallows or blue tits or um, starlings or so, they like to, to uh, when they migrate, they like to roost near uh, water bodies. So for example, in reed stands or so. And so somehow people decided or thought that they actually went underwater and hibernated underwater. And there must have been some records of uh, fishermen in the past that with their fishing nets pulled out some birds. There must have been an event of that sort, maybe after a storm or so, because there's so many historical pictures from the like um, late Middle Ages onwards or so. And that was taken as evidence that the birds indeed overwintered underwater. And then they had other ideas of where they would hibernate, for example, that they would hibernate in the, in shells, like shells hanging from trees and so on. So there were, were quite, quite a, a few uh, crazy ideas. And then people, maybe like the craziest one was actually that birds would fly to the moon over winter and then come back. And I think it was based on, on the fact that if you look at the uh, a bright moon during migration nights, you can actually see the birds in front of the moon against the, the, the light of the moon as like a little shadow. And I think this is probably what people uh, observed. So they thought like, well, that's where they fly. Yeah. That's, well, it's quite, it's quite like a romantic image as well. And um, I mean, it's not, I guess, not that far off. It was at least um, flying to the moon. So sort of like flying somewhere, it's kind mm -hmm. of going somewhere and then returning, um, I guess hibernating and uh, kind of going underwater. Going underwater is quite uh, <laughs> quite extreme. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it seems like from actually what you said before as well of the almost like folkloric stories um, and observations of people and the scientific stories, there was a kind of distinction um, between them and even though they both are kind of were based on observation. Um, and they kind of um, looking back on them, the most of them, they all look quite equally fantastic at the moment. Um, however, still a distinction between a bird as a symbol and an actual bird that kind of, you know, a bird as a living creature starts to appear. And I wanted to um, read this um, hotel this uh, Lithuanian uh, myth about a story actually being a human being. So it goes as following. In Lithuania, it was thought that White Stork used to be a human being. Even his name is known, Stonilus. When God was creating the world and saw that there are too many snakes and other creatures unpleasant to human beings on earth, he put all the worst ones in the bag, asked Stonilus to come and draw and drown that bag at the bottom of a lake. But he warned him not to look inside. However, Stonilus, being very curious, could not resist and didn't listen to God. He opened the bag to glimpse at what's inside and let all the gods damn snakes outside. 
When he, torn by guilt, got back to Sigar and confessed his sins, God got very angry, took a burned stick, and hit Stonilus with turning him into a stork. He told Stonilus to collect all the loose snakes. To this day, a stork is collecting snakes, and those black feathers not far from its tail reminds people about God's wrath, God's anger, and the burned stick. So it's kind of, um, yeah, there's a, this clear connection between um, a stork and a human being here as well. Um, and back to my kind of question, um, do you think that's, that distinction exists? And do you think and it still exists? And if it's changing at all? It's, it's, it's very, uh, uh, very easy to move between kind of seeing an animal as a wild animal to seeing it as kind of a more or less human creature. Uh, you know, there's still, of course, we grow up with folk songs about the, the Mr. Stork or Mrs. Stork walking across the meadow. And so, so maybe for storks, this is particularly strong. But it happens so often. Like, for example, um, I've been listening to a number of, of uh, stories recently. Now, there are cameras that you can put to a nest, for example, of a... Um, an eagle or an owl or so and people are really interested in that if this is live streamed and I yeah. know of a small town where uh, on a castle actually one of well, our largest owl the eagle owl is nesting and it's on webcam and it has tens of thousands of followers and they keep posting now pictures that like screenshots from from the footage and then they put like words to it, like a uh, little owl, young owl asking, mama, mama, bring me more mice or whatever, you know, and all of a sudden, and they got names. So they're just very easily uh, moving on from, from being a wild creature to actually being kind of a, a human by projection. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, and I guess um, if we move from these kind of, various folkloric or scientific theories about migration, quite um, the sort of, even the scientific ones being quite fantastic. Um, I know that something that was an end to many of these fantastic theorists was called an arrow stork. In German, there's a spe even specific word for it. And excuse my German pronunciation, it's probably going to be very bad, but um, it's called Pleistork. Mm -hmm. How, how do you say? Feilstorch. Feilstorch. <laughs> um, so can you tell me a little bit about this discovery and how the knowledge or theories about migration have changed from that point? Yeah, there was actually, I always find it a bit sad, uh, this story, because as mm -hmm. I said, people were always fascinated with uh, storks. Um, yeah, storks bringing babies and all of these things. And then... Uh, Actually, the first time in the, in the 1830s and then a few times later, people actually observed storks that came back with a, a really long spear, not just an arrow, actually like more like a spear, like a meter or, or longer, long, um, right across their, their throat. So they carried this all the way on their migration, this really heavy spear. And uh, it had gone... Well, they were hit by it, but obviously it had just gotten stuck in the skin, so they were still able to fly. And uh, after flying all that distance from the wintering grounds where they were hunted this way, actually, as soon as they came back to Germany with these with these spears, people were so fascinated, so they shot them down. <laughs> so they traveled all that way just to die <laughs> then because of the, the, the spear. And then they got put into museums and so on. But by that time, of course, much of Africa was colonized. And so people, experts from the local museums, identified that as a Bantu spear originating all the way from South Africa. And this was found several times in these storks that they carried this. Just imagine South Africa, tip of the African continent, all the way back to, to kind of the north of, of, of Europe. 
flying with this, the spear. But that then indicated how far these, these animals went. And by that time, humans also had kind of a map of, of these distances. They knew how long it would take a human with a boat, for example, to go that far. Mm -hmm. And then from that time on, people kind of knew uh, that it was actually the same individual mm -hmm. that would turn up in one place or the other. Yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, I was just thinking about this. It just quite, with, with the knowledge that we have now, it's really hard to imagine that. It's really hard to imagine even the, um, I don't know, the way of thinking <laughs> of how, like, why, why people sort of in a way not communicated to each other. It was sort of like, well, whether even like, I guess there were, the, there were like colonial times and stuff, but people were kind of going, um, the same colonists going to Africa, they would kind of see the same birds. So I don't, it's just so, yeah, strange. Um, well, and they, I guess, um, they, they might have just thought it just, oh, well, there's dogs here in Africa as well, you know, <laughs> but it's just not imagining. How could you imagine that? Just imagine like a journey from, from, from say, Germany to, to, to the tip of South Africa. So probably took like five months or so. I don't know, with a, with a, with a sail ship. How could you imagine that a bird could do this? I mean, it's still, yeah. even now, fascinating. So they put the so they put the historic uh, with an arrow into the museum as a kind of a, a very interesting specimen and by yes. accident mm -hmm. kind of thought of the arrow is um let's say from South Africa. Yeah, that's really amazing. So after this kind of, but even despite this um, discovery, which um, I guess changed changed the way migration of birds or animals, I guess um, overall are seen. And there was still quite a lot of stories generated about um, migration, uh, birds, storks, um, both in terms of kind of discoveries and mythologies. Um, and I guess here um, we or I are speaking from quite Eurocentric perspective, but um, uh, a certain research that I done before, I kind of show that what sort of tends to unite different places and different um, countries and continents it's uh, what could be called a common knowledge or popular knowledge and how that knowledge humanizes um, the bird. Um, stork, stork actually in particular, because it's, it's, um, it's very vivid symbol in many, many different, um, uh, yeah, kind of cultures, mythologies. So why do you think that is? Why do you think a stork is such a humanized bird? I guess in some ways it's kind of humanized itself because um, breeding right in the, the villages on people's houses, walks across the fields right in front of the village and so on. So in some ways, compared to a, a wild animal that you know you have to seek out in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a forest, for example, there's also black storks, right? And quite a few also in the, in the Baltic is a, is a relatively good spot for them still. But the black stork would never have had this kind of attention because it's kind of breeding in, in, in swamp forests where people actually don't really like going. So I think that, that's, that's part of it. But it also like the, it, it's large and striking and it walks upright. There is a, it, it is a little bit like a person walking there, I suppose. So that certainly, I think, makes it easier for humans to, to, to kind of <laughs> transfigure it into a figure. Yeah, um, but do you do these kind of birds, well, storks? Do they live um, amongst people for for quite a long time? Yeah, yeah. It's thought that it's been um, a, a couple of thousand years or so since they first discovered that they can breed on on human um, structures. And mm. hard to know why why they would be so much less shy and so much more flexible than, for example like a black stock in this case, right? That just doesn't do the same thing. They breed on, on you know, big trees and, mm -hmm. and nests that are left behind from, for example, raptors or so. Mm -hmm. But the white storks just, you know, they're, they're very flexible in terms of where they breed and they don't seem to be so shy of humans either. Mm -hmm. It seems like a quite um, a long built relationship amongst people and, and storks. Mm. Um, I was also reading somewhere um, 
And actually, a scientific paper, but what was, um, it made me laugh that at the beginning, a stork was um, defined as a chancer. <laughs> as a what? Uh, as a chancer. So sort of like um, chancing, I don't know, being as a lazy bird in, in, in terms that, um, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go an extra mile to kind of um, maybe t to look for food, for instance, but it would kind of the reason that would um, live with people because it was very convenient for them and they wouldn't be afraid of people so much and they would kind of just take the chance of living with people rather than, um, you know, kind of as black storks sort of make their own environment in the woods. Um, and the kind of, I guess, um, yeah, like even the, how environment is changing now a little bit, um, storks sort of feeding on um, rubbish, et cetera, et cetera. It's also kind of, yeah, they're kind of going, going alongside people in a way. Um, so yeah, I kind of believe that some of these uh, stories emerge from living, like you said, sort of close to people as well and as well kind of maybe um, the way Stork looks as well for it to be humanized but that relationship between um, a man and a Stork um, is, is kind of like almost having an interconnected life but I guess we could here expand into more um, animals or birds of the role and going back in time to more kind of agricultural times and having living in a more rural society there was a more interconnected life between these um different species so maybe uh, maybe the reason the, the kind of like stories were generated because they were more relatable in a sense but kind of in the context of now in the context of our times um with the change change system and structure and changed environment this kind of connection of human and um human and an animal or human and a bird sort of disappears. However, what is left is the kind of this mythological creature and this kind of mythological shell of um, the, the, the way we saw an animal when we were connecting to them, but that disappeared. So we just still s somehow see that animal in that sense. Um, so I kind of what I was wondering recently is something that if the love, affection, and fascination with, um, let's say, bird migration that is often displayed in popular media, example, the tabloids, um, is in fact more for a symbol of a bird rather than the bird as a living creature. Um, do, you, do you think that is the case? And why do you think yeah, that is? Yeah, I mean, we talked uh, about one of the fascinations also just being, you know, kind of being able to move so freely, apparently to humans. And I think that kind of like carries carries our, our dreams to some extent. And as dogs, obviously they're large, you see them, but they're also like, they glide. So they use warm uh, air currents that are moving up and then they wheel up on these air currents. And then they just glide with their wings wide open, and I guess it's a yeah, it's a human dream for sure. Um, but do you think do you think it's somehow it's somehow a little bit dangerous to um, to be kind of fixated on this um, on this kind of quite um, symbolic uh, viewing of a bird of a stork? Yeah, I mean, we obviously we see just what we want to see in this case. So um, talk about our storks as if, for example, they're, they're on the breeding grounds for less of the year, less time of the year than they're elsewhere. But they still seem to be our storks here. And, uh, and it's kind of like, um, yeah, it kind of transforms. It can be seen as positive in some ways as well, that it gives us opportunities to link to nature, we're interested in watching them and so on, but it does take some effort to remember what the animal actually needs. Mm -hmm. I think you, yeah, I think you're really right here and that's, um, yeah, I think having that continuous effort to try and, to, try to uh, um, realize or kind of see what the animal actually is 
Um, and I guess the, the reason the reason why I started this project overall, because I was kind of quite interested why Stork is being nationalized so much, um, especially, I guess it's nationalized in quite a few different um, countries or context, uh, but in Lithuania, a lot of people do refer to a Stork as our Stork, um, even though it kind of, you know, lives in here, um, ha well, it breeds here, but it still lives half of its life um, here. So it's not exactly sort of, native to here or there is kind of a migratory bird and it kind of it creates I guess certain problems as well that um, come not only in terms of birds but also in terms of people and the way we see each other and etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, in Lithuania a lot there's because there's still um, some stork shooting somewhere so they would say oh they are shooting our storks etc cetera, etc cetera, which is kind of well First of all, they're not yours. Secondly, <laughs> um, there's way more kind of dangerous to that. Um, so yeah, I kind of, what I was thinking is if we, because you mentioned as well, um, the way we uh, project our kind of ideas and dreams of freedom um, and this kind of the image of a historic gliding um, on hot air streams, um, currents, um, so if we extend the symbolism of a bird, um, of, um, yeah, of a bird flying freely in the sky, in a way there's like no troubles, no borders, and kind of ensure that there are no real world issues affecting them. Um, and of course, what I'm saying here is quite saturated, um, but I think even a more abstract idea of it could be quite dangerous because it also takes us humans away from responsibility um, we have towards the world and we have towards um, other living creatures. Um, so while some still imagine Storic in this folkloric rural context, in present times, um, Storics or other birds are being directly affected and have to adapt to not only environmental changes, um, but also to the socio-political context and um, where borders and laws and economical factors, et cetera, et cetera, um, influence the journey too. So in this context, could you maybe name a few examples or expand a little bit on maybe how certain laws and military grounds, economic positions affect birds on the migratory route or routes? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good example. But I just wanted to, to backstep uh, one one bit and say, like, yeah. obviously, we can never see nature for what it is or maybe. I mean, it's always through our mind and our observation and so on. And so it's good to reflect on what we see. I mean, that stork that may be gliding effortlessly, maybe heat stressed because the, the planet is warming so quickly and so on. But we don't uh, see that necessarily. So... Partly it matters what we what we know, what we can see. And partly, of course, from our observations, we can cherry pick a little bit. And there are many, many good things we can also think of rather than the kind of what you said, national thinking of storks. These are our storks. They're just on holidays and then they're back. <laughs> you can also <laughs> think of them uh, connecting, connecting continents and connecting maybe a house somewhere in South Africa and a house somewhere in Lithuania or so. I mean, that's beautiful in some ways, but it's still, of course, symbolic. But uh, the symbolism, we can see maybe a little bit as, as, as material for us to make something of it, something useful. Um, but now going to your, uh, uh, moving on back to your, your question on economical, maybe sociopolitical factors, one of the risks of, of, of romanticizing an animal is then, of course, sometimes it's a little bit painful to see the realities of the animal's life. And storks in particular, especially on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain and, and uh, Portugal, mm -hmm. have moved quite a bit from actually migrating to just feeding on landfills, on dumps. Because they are so uh, prone to be with humans and not afraid of, of, of human influences. Um, they quite readily took to, to feed from our waste 
And then for young storks, that became such a easy way to survive the winter that quite a few of these non-migrants actually survived really well. And so it seems that migration behavior may be stopping um, due to, to our, our waste. But now there's a new uh, EU um, regulation coming up. It's actually in many ways a very good environmental regulation that the landfills need to be closed so that there shouldn't be so much spill over of our sometimes like horrible things that we put in onto our landfills or so to nature. But for species that have now gotten used to, to these sources, that can of course cause a major problem. And especially if a young stork has never migrated and then you know, the feeding source is gone, that's potentially um, deadly uh, a change for, for, for these storks. Mm-hmm. So these are these are some examples, and then the flyways where the the storks like to go, where they're particularly concentrated, are often also for us humans strategically important uh, places, military sites, airports, and so on. And so there's quite a bit of of conflict between these birds using their flight corridors and the humans actually don't wanting them there because if they collide with an airplane, of course cost human lives and you know, that's, that's a risk that, that humans strive to avoid. So that is one of the contexts in which uh, stork migration or bird migration in general is being studied, especially with these airstrikes. Yeah, true. Yeah, there's a kind of, I guess, in more, let's say, current context or more um, current times, there's, there's still an overlap, overlap um, between um, people and birds, but it's, um, yeah, it's just quite different to, to something that was in rural context and this beautiful imagery of, um, I don't know, a, a lady with loads of birds on <laughs> her hands or something. Um, it's more, yeah, how um, flyways or path, pathways of, uh, migratory pathways or flash with military uh, training grounds um, and how the sort of birds collide with fighting jets um, or kind of if there's a war somewhere, how is that affecting as well? Not only um, people, but as well birds is kind of, I guess, affecting the whole world in a sense. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I know that you are an expert in timekeeping and biological clocks and birds that have to do a great deal with migratory uh, behaviors and could you maybe, to start with briefly, if that's possible at all, um, explain what are these elements in white storks? Um, if we, again, stick to kind of stork as a key study. <laughs> um, and how do these biological clocks work, how they influence migration and um, so on? Yeah, I um, started out by, by talking about how amazing it is actually to, to watch migration just the coming in there, the, the, the going of birds and how some cultures actually planted their crops on, on the arrival of a certain species or so. But if you think about uh, what it takes for a bird to actually do that, to go that far and come back so punctually, so much in time, that's just scientifically and intellectually, intellectually also like superbly interesting. I mean, if we humans were sent off basically as young people um, just say like, oh, well, just move down to South Africa and be back next uh, next year, 1st of May or so, <laughs> without airplanes, without ships or, or trains or so, it'd be obviously totally, totally helpless. So these animals, in order to be able to complete these journeys, carry them out, they have amazing capacities that we humans can actually only envy. Mm-hmm. I guess some there's some indication that maybe there are some of these some of these uh, capacities to like a very small degree are also inside us, but we've forgotten about them. But basically, birds are experts on on finding the way, space, mm-hmm. and also knowing the time. And that's why, from a perspective of of biological rhythms or so, it's so fascinating to think about bird migration as well, mm-hmm. and especially. If you think how, how humans uh, used to measure the progress of time, I've, I've mentioned the Mayan temples, for example, 
uh, Mayan calendar or um, Stonehenge or so, that was always by the position of the sun on, at certain times of year. And that works relatively well also for other organisms. A tree, for example, can do that, like measure when the days are getting long and so on. But as soon as you start migrating, it just doesn't work anymore. Because if they cross the equator um, in the autumn, then actually it's going to be spring on the southern hemisphere. So they would be entirely misled. If they went just by that, they would think like, well, just say October, they're arriving on the southern hemisphere, that's April. Perfect. Let's build a nest, <laughs> stay here and breed. And so, but they don't. They just feed and so on. And at some point, while sometimes even similar species at the winter quarters start breeding, they don't. And instead, then they get restless. And pretty much at exactly the right time of year, they, they take off. And I think from quite early times, at least 150 years on or so, people realized that they must then carry clocks inside them that help them get the time right. If they can't use the sun, they can't use, there's no snow, nothing, I mean, like snow, nothing obvious in the environment that they could just, be, just naively interpret. So quite clearly they carry these clocks and these clocks are also useful for other things. For example, for orientation, among other things, they use the position of the sun. And if you're out there camping, you might want to do the same thing. Like you want to find south, okay, you look at the sun. But it only works if you also have a sense of time. You know, if you look at your, your, your watch and you see it's it's noon, okay, then you can assume this this is pretty much south if you go towards the sun. And birds do that as well. They can. They actually, without a, a, a watch, they can calculate from the position of the sun by the time that they carry inside which direction they need to go. So migratory birds are, are actually really like pretty, pretty awesome timekeepers. And um, in storks, some of this has been studied as well. Storks are a little bit different from some of our small um, songbirds because most of our small migratory songbirds fly actually at night and many of them go on solo migration but storks they like to be in groups they're quite social on their, their migrations and then they watch each other and in these thermals where the, the hot air takes them up or so they kind of see each other and try to join each other as well so they use kind of like a bit of group intelligence as well to know where to go and when to go but a young stork that hatches from an egg and grows up cannot be totally sure that it will have actually guidance. And so what people have shown, uh, also including areas near Lithuania, the Kurish Spit, uh, they've observed that if they like, like held on to some of the young storks until the parents are all gone, and then they put a little transmitter on the stork so that they can watch, observe where the stork flies. The stork will have roughly the right idea where to go, but only roughly. So it would never go north, it would never go east, but it roughly goes south southerly, so just where it needs to go, but it's not very good at it without other storks. And so what they've observed was that the storks actually kind of did the right thing, these young storks, but one of the storks, for example, flew for a bit and then it had like a really like totally crazy shift of direction and in this case the researchers went and looked at the what happened to the stork and what happened was that it had caught up with a couple of experienced older storks and then that young stork decided okay like probably much better off <laughs> uh, joining them now I'm speaking anthropomorphically like uh, as about a human uh, but basically <laughs> ended up joining them and then they, 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 they uh, moved on as a, as a group after that. So it's basically in, if we speaking of storks and I guess other um, bird species as well, um, some of them, they kind of, they migrate based on kind of uh, passed on knowledge, kind of like almost uh, passed on heritage, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, evolution, yeah. So if, if, if you always um, know when I mean, winter always comes at the same time of year and you have like a, a place to go, safe place to go in winter, 
then over evolution that becomes part of the genetic uh, makeup of a, of a species and then they just they hatch from their egg and they're going to know mm. i guess maybe that's um also one of the reasons why um what well, maybe it's one of the other reasons why um Dorks are so humanized too, because they sort of learn socially in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Um, so, do you think kind of the changing environments, demographics, as well as topography, um, somehow alter these biological clocks? And how? Um, what are the most severe documented or instances that you know of? Yeah, I mean, there's so many changes to the the, the also the the timing. Uh, of the environment from from us humans was most obvious on a on a day night level when the nights are no longer really dark in many parts of the the world mm. and so i mean over evolutionary time over millions of years there was a change between dark nights and 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 bright days and now of course you have to actually go off into a special park the dedicated conservation areas that are dark sky parks so the children can still see the Milky Way, because now the majority of, of uh, children, at least in, in Western countries, have never seen the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. And so the loss of the night is certainly confusing, and especially migratory birds are known to actually sometimes get trapped by the thousands or millions, maybe even by bright lights uh, at night, which mm -hmm. they then mistake that it messes up their orientation system. Somehow they get trapped. And just many, many die and collide with buildings and so on. So that's that's a problem. Um, in terms of the seasons, there's both climate change and mm -hmm. what I just talked about, food availability at times when it wasn't available or so. It kind of messes up uh, the, the, well, the kind of the, the temporal, the, the, the course of the seasons as the birds had known it over evolutionary time. And one of the, the changes that hasn't been reported too much for storks, but for some other species, is that uh, they always came back, say, for the 1st of May or 1st of April or so. Our world is now a different one on, on 1st of April because mm -hmm. the springs come earlier and, of course, the fields may you know, carry crops that are already like far advanced or so. Mm -hmm. And for quite a few species, that actually is a, is a, a deadly risk. Yeah, um, I think actually, because I've been speaking to quite a few uh, people here in Lithuania while kind of um, shooting the film and just um, speaking to, let's say, people living in villages. And quite a few of them actually told me that um, this year, every well, almost everyone actually was saying that this year storks arrived really early because um, here in Lithuania is the 25th of um, March that is celebrated officially the return of storks, uh, the day of the the day that celebrates the return of storks. Mm -hmm. um, but people were saying they go back as early as the 10th of uh, March or 15th, um, which is, I, I guess, it's quite a big chunk of time. Yes, indeed. Um, and, and if you think of, of what we talked about uh, with, the, with, the, with the dumps, that's another really good example. So, okay, now they are maybe okay if they come in, in winter or stay in winter because the, the seasonality of food is, is less extreme because there's this human waste food but if they close the dumps even if they do it for good reasons all of a sudden they're back to the, the historical change between food availability you know and food just yeah. being like difficult to find in winter and then yeah. they're trapped if they've given up on their their their, their old rhythm true true um so do you think is that anything us as the kind of normal human beings um, not involved in science in um, any way can do anything to kind of reverse it or kind of how can we help to create a more in touch interconnected world so sort of, with other living creatures yeah I think for for, for migratory uh, species in, in in particular it's really important um, to just to think how vulnerable they are because you know, if you can protect a, a, an animal that, that lives, stays year round in one meadow, you can protect it if you protect that meadow, at least mm -hmm. to some extent. But if that animal covers thousands of kilometers, can, you know, die anywhere, run out of food anywhere. And so I think 
we have to, if we want to help migratory animals, we have to think globally also about nature con conservation. It doesn't help. It doesn't suffice uh, if we if we protect our 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 forest or our meadow, if they then die on the route or so. I think this is global thinking that it's good for for animals. It's good for us as well. And then another thing that is important, I believe, are the night lights because. I think we have no idea how many millions of, of birds um, die from that. And it's so tempting now because the lights are beautiful often. They're like easily available. Sometimes they make us feel safe or so. But we're really changing basically a big part of, uh, you know, how, how organisms have perceived nature. Yeah. So I think that resist the temptation and don't put floodlights in your in your your village unless you really really need to and so so there are a bunch of little things that you can do that i think help a lot yeah yeah um thank you for that i think um actually what you were saying about the global thing um when i was speaking to derek robertson who you kind of um referred me to who is a scottish um, watercolor artist as well as a keen ornithologist we kind of finished our conversation on a note that I think is quite suitable here as well. Um, and perhaps it's quite a utopian idea, utopian thought, but I guess also we should maybe all strive towards it. Um, and it is nevertheless an important note to mention here too. Um, so we were saying that in order to have less impact, um, less negative impact on other species, species, we first of all have to take care of one another as humans too. So we have to kind of in a way strive for equality, for peace and for mutual understanding, respect and kind of equal co coexistence. Because as we kind of were discussing things like um, borders, military things, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, they also affect um, not only us, but also um, other species. And kind of to strive for a world where in a sense, military actions and political actions, borders, laws, don't have a negative effect on birds, but also don't have a negative effect on people. And where not only birds are free in this imaginary world of the free flight, but also people are striving for the same sort of freedom too. Um, and yeah, I guess this is our time too. Um, and thank you so much for this conversation. And maybe I should uh, go back to um, Katrina, who is here. And I'm not sure if uh, yeah anyone has any questions. We saw. Yes. Yeah, th I would like to thank you for really engaging talk and uh, for sharing. Uh, for first of all, Maria, for preparing such insightful questions and for Barbara for sharing your knowledge and, and experience. And I have a little question. So since no one has yet posted about the cameras that you mentioned in the beginning, I, you can call them surveillance cameras, right? They put uh, the kind of film birds routine. And what is your opinion, Barbara, about that? Uh, obviously, it's a good way to popularize ornithology and to to kind of provide people um, opportunity to, to actually learn more about birds circle uh, routine. And obviously your mentioned example, example was successful because people got really engaged in this little owl's life. But uh, in general, what is the, uh, what kind of uh, effect does it have on, on birds life? Well, I would think these cameras can now be put up if, if it's done with care, without much direct effect on the birds. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's of course tempting that you would just put it right in front of the, the nest and maybe the bird would be scared or so. So I think there should be a good code for best practice of how to do this. But then I think it will be okay for the bird and then it just depends on what we make of it. For example, if say in some species, uh, maybe the chicks will starve it's possible, you know, if it's like a bad weather or pesticides are being used extensively or so, then be careful with a kind of like a humanizing it. Then it's maybe like tempting to take this footage out, to not let people see this horrible ending. 
to these chicks that all have names now from humans or so. But if we do that, then I think we're actually just at least losing a great opportunity. We're also in some ways, I think we are, we are we're quite, it could be quite damaging because mm -hmm. then we only pick from the animal what we like to see and make it basically into like a toy uh, without learning our lessons. But if we are careful about these things, I think it can actually maybe emotionalize people about, like, for example, you know, chicks dying if, if, if the landscape doesn't produce enough food for them anymore and so on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, sorry, go, Maria. No, go ahead. No, I, I just, uh, I also had um, just uh, recently learned fact about actually Starks uh, that uh, it's we kind of yeah you talked a lot about all the prejudices that we have when you think about Starks and also the way they live and the way they build the way the partnerships that they build and I just recently learned the fact that we don't really usually lead monogamous lives and it was a, a new thing to me and uh, I kind of just wanted to uh maybe reflect that probably by learning these facts you really can rethink your relationship with the bird that you don't really have to judge it from your own perspective and i guess learning more of these facts could help us to build more kind of equal relationship to accept more their own ways of life so welcome yeah yeah yeah, I agree with that too. And actually, the uh, there are a few cameras as such in Lithuania. Um, I think there's in a few different places um, documenting um, the life of storks. And actually, with um, one of the people on whose house was the nest and the camera, I kind of uh, spoke to him a little bit as well. Um, so people could absorb for could could observe for twenty four hours a day for all actually a few years what was happening in that nest and um yeah i think it's i think it's quite fascinating because you can like you were saying it would be important to not um cut out information that we as humans sort of perceive that is um not acceptable to us for instance there's a i guess common practice let's say between um stories that they 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 would throw the um chicks out of the nest um, and there's one actually I've seen by accident because I think the all, uh, algorithm of uh, YouTube now just plays random uh, stork videos to me <laughs> once in a while. Um, so there's one, I think in Poland, where um, stork just kind of like chucks um, chick out of, um, out of a nest. Um, and it's quite, it's quite a dramatic scene, but I think it's important to, um, yeah, what Katrina was saying, to um, see those things and actually really try to understand them for what what they really are not the way we kind of project them as a kind of we're saying the monogamy as well and we kind of we as humans the reason yeah this bird becomes so like mythologized so kind of maybe misunderstood as well because we have this image of what it's supposed to be but when it doesn't fulfill our kind of fantasies we kind of get quite um disappointed disattached and kind of you know then trying to almost like cause harm to that bird but you know as you, you cause harm to that bird you cause harm to big environmental um yeah system system and so on and etc um as i see there are no questions uh so I think it's a nice way to end the, the conversation. And I would just like to thank you again for joining Maria and Barbara. And I just forgot to mention in the beginning that uh, Rupert programs are uh, funded by Tuanian Cult uh, Council of Cul Culture. So I'd like to thank them for making this translation available. And um, yeah, so thank you very much. and. Um, yeah, this actually the same here. I also forgot to say thank you to Lithuanian Council of 
involved <laughs> to, to um, supporting this uh, project. And yeah, thank you so much, Barbara, for joining um, us today. It was really um, a great ple pleasure to talk to you and thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, likewise, thank you. Good, then have a good day, everybody. <laughs> yeah, have a good day. Bye. Bye. How do we?